Therefore, put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Welcome to St Andrew's Cathedral, Sydney, Australia, and the final edition of Church at Home, our online ministry during this time of the COVID pandemic. The pandemic is not over. Around the world, the virus continues to spread in alarming numbers, and there's a global wave of grief. We'll be praying for the restraint of the disease and the search for a vaccine later on in our time together. Today at the cathedral, our mid-morning service gathers again in person for the first time in 36 weeks. So this is the last edition of Church at Home. Over all that time, it's been our great privilege to broadcast this online ministry. We're very grateful to Anglican Media Sydney for making it possible for us to bring you this ministry while we and so many others have been unable to meet in person at our local churches. And the cathedral has also been closed. It's been an absolute joy and honour to be joined by you from around Sydney, Australia and the world. Thanks especially to those of you who've, been, uh, who've sent us encouraging messages of support and appreciation and those of you who've shared a little of the way in which the Lord has blessed you through this ministry. We praise God for every one of you. In the new year, we hope to be live streaming from inside the cathedral, so please check our website for updates. Why does it matter that we can meet together in person again? In many ways, what happens in church is unremarkable. A few people, some readings from an old book, some uplifting music, a little wine and bread. But in the power of his spirit, Jesus is present among his people. By his word, he rules and comforts and trains us. We hear his voice, we know his love, we trust his promise, we sing his praise. We proclaim his gospel. We love and serve one another and encourage one another to do the works he's prepared for us to do for his glory and the good of this broken and needy world. As we approach the season of Advent, we hear the words of Jesus, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of you. We have come together as the Church of God to fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, to encourage one another to hold fast to the hope he has given us and to spur one another to love and good deeds.
Let us affirm with Christians across the ages what we believe about God and his love for us in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Gracious God, your word is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Today, when we hear your voice, deliver us from hardness of heart. Help us to put away everything that keeps us from persevering in your way. For the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. The Old Testament reading is from Psalm 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This reading is from the New Testament, from the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled round your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Here's a secret. The Christian life can be a struggle. For those of us who are convinced about the Lordship of Jesus Christ and know that his yoke is easy and his burden is light, it is nevertheless true that the Christian life can be a struggle. We experience frustration about the slowness of our transformation, the reluctance we still have to put the interests of others ahead of ourselves, 
the ease with which we fall into self-righteousness, the difficulty of loving the little enemies in our life, the neighbour who never returns our garden equipment, the work colleague who insists on vulgar jokes and gossip, the parent who continues to domineer. They are hard to love, and to do so for Christ's sake can be a struggle. But the scriptures teach us that the Christian life is more than a struggle against the old patterns of selfish behaviour. More than that, the scriptures teach that the way of the Christian is opposed by an enemy of God and an enemy of God's people, an adversary, or to use the Hebrew word for adversary, the Christian way is opposed by a Satan. These two thoughts, the struggle to choose the Lord and his way and the fight against our enemy are captured in the last petition of the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Jesus teaches his followers to pray, our Father in heaven, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let's think about temptation and testing. Why would we need to ask God to not lead us into temptation? The Apostle James says, God does not tempt anyone. James chapter one, verse 13. And in the next verse, he says, each person is tempted by their own desire. In the Bible, there's one word that means both testing and temptation. And the difference between them is one of perspective. The Lord does test our faith and train us by his testing to resist sin, to endure affliction, to live in dependence and to cling to hope. He trains us to look to him, to lean on him, to learn from him. We are more conformed to the likeness of Christ by facing the test and resisting than by enjoying God's blessings. The temptation or test from which we seek deliverance can take many forms. Calvin mentions too, we can be tempted by things that are not evil in themselves, but are used by the evil one to draw us away from God. Wealth and reputation, power and pleasure can draw us away from God and tempt us to forget the giver of good gifts, the creator and judge of our souls. We can be drawn away by God's own good gifts. Lord, lead us not down that path where we become captivated by created things and forget our creator. But Calvin says we can be tempted not by good and glorious gifts of God, but by suffering, deprivation, guilt and shame and anxiety and fear can drive us away from God. Sometimes the very knowledge of our sinfulness or the experience of hardship can embitter us against God, cause us to despair, to give up our assurance and lose hope. We can be lured away by the seductive desires of our own hearts. We can be crushed by the lies and accusations of the evil one. Good Lord, deliver us. Now we usually pray, deliver us from evil. But the prayer, as we read it in Matthew's gospel, says, deliver us from the evil one. And that's an important distinction. When we pray, deliver us from evil, it may be that we bring to mind the things we fear, the things we wish to be spared. We may be thinking, deliver us from COVID-19, spare me from bereavement, rescue me from failure. And there's nothing at all wrong with that kind of prayer. But Jesus is being more specific than that here. Not deliver us from evil in a general sense, but more specifically, deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from our enemy. This is the prayer of God's people to be delivered from the enemy of God's people and the enemy of God's kingdom. Deliver us from the evil one. A prayer like that doesn't come so naturally to me. So who is our enemy? C.S. Lewis said that there were two equal and opposite errors made in relation to the devil. The first is to dismiss him out of hand, and the second is to be too interested in him. Both errors work in his favour. In the Bible, evil is not just an abstract force. There is a personal dimension to evil. Jesus refers to the evil one who snatches away the word of God so that people don't understand it. Jesus calls him a murderer of the prophets and the father of lies. The Gospels reveal that the evil one is a tempter. John calls him the one who accuses God's people. Peter says that he's a lion who prowls around looking for someone to devour. We underestimate personal evil when we think that lack of success in evangelism is just a matter of not getting the packaging right or a lack of persuasiveness rather than the personal opposition of the evil one. 
or when we think that moral failure among Christians is simply a matter of giving in to cultural norms or boredom. No, we have an enemy who opposes the work of God and the way of God's people. Paul says in verse 12 of Ephesians 6, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our fight is against the devil and his servants. There's a bigger framework, a larger struggle. We're not simply trying to convince a neighbor to give up some bad habit or even change the world through democracy. Paul pictures a cosmic supernatural struggle. Knowing that the devil is our enemy, of course, helps us to know who is not our enemy. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, that is against people. When we ask to be delivered from evil, we do not mean deliver us from the unbelievers around us. The people around us are just the people we long to be better at, at loving and serving. When we detect in ourselves an attitude of superiority or judgmentalism or contempt for other people, then we should pray, Lord, deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us so that as a church, we might be saved from lovelessness and harshness towards just those people whom Jesus has come to save and with whom he expects us to share the news of his victory over sin and his invitation into life. Our enemy is the one who makes our presentation of the gospel so harsh that no one is attracted to it or so pale that no one notices it. We have an enemy, not other people, the evil one. Now, why do we pray deliver us from the evil one when surely Jesus has already delivered us? Doesn't scripture say God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son whom he loves? Doesn't it say Jesus has made a public spectacle of the powers and authorities, the devil's lieutenants, triumphing over them by the cross? Aren't we already delivered from the evil one? The answer scripture gives to that question is a resounding yes. We are delivered, transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the sun. No longer slaves of sin, but now sons and daughters of God in whom the spirit dwells as the deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance and having a living hope that is kept for us, imperishable. The person who is trusted in Jesus is a citizen of heaven. Now, kept by the word of God's grace and equipped for God's service until the appearing of our savior, from heaven. So why then do we continue to pray, deliver us? In the death and resurrection of Jesus, the devil is defeated, but not yet done away with. This is the day of salvation, the Bible says, when the gospel is to be proclaimed to the ends of the earth for the gathering in of all those appointed to life. So a battle with our defeated enemy continues as those who are held in his grip are set free by the truth of the gospel. There is a struggle. And so we pray, deliver us from the evil one. Now we tend to hear this prayer and to pray it as an individual believer, but the Lord teaches his disciples to pray together, deliver us from the evil one. This is a prayer of the church, the fellowship of believers. And there's good reason for the church to pray like this. The church is the proof of Christ's victory. Ephesians says that people who are far from God have been brought near. That people who are foreigners to God's promises have become citizens of God's kingdom. That people who are dead in sin have become members of God's family. And that people alienated from each other have been reconciled. And the church that belongs to Jesus is the proof of all this. Christ has been victorious. Ephesians 3 says that through the church, the manifest wisdom of God is made known to the rulers and authorities, the very minions of Satan who have been defeated. So the gathering of Jesus' disciples who pray the prayer that Jesus taught is the great sign of God's victory over the devil. Wherever there is a gathering of Christians, there the announcement is made. Christ is King, humans and God at peace, reconciled to one another, a new humanity united under Christ. And for that reason, the church is the focus of the devil's attacks. Revelation chapter 12 says the devil is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. 
Now, what are the weapons the devil may use from which we must seek deliverance? The Lord's Prayer is a prayer for the Lord's disciples to pray together as a body. What are the snares of the evil one to which the body of Christ is subject? In Revelation, John sees Jesus standing among the churches and delivering his assessment of their common life. To the church in Ephesus, Jesus says, you've forsaken your first love, repent and do what you did at first. Imagine a church that stopped loving Jesus, stopped knowing Jesus, stopped listening to Jesus, stopped obeying Jesus. Can you imagine a church like that? The church that tires of the gospel, the church that assumes the gospel, the church that says, that's old hat, we know it, we've heard it before, that church has lost its first love. When Jesus speaks to the churches, he holds against them that some have yielded to false teachers who have led them into greed and sexual immorality and the worship of false gods. Who ever heard of a church that has been led into greed or sexual immorality by its leaders? Recent years have seen a depressing parade of well-known and influential church leaders step down from their ministry because of sins of immorality and greed. Jesus says to some of the churches that they have a reputation for being alive but are dead, and to some that they are neither hot nor cold but lukewarm. Faith without fruit, love without wisdom, truth without love, zeal without knowledge, orthodoxy without righteousness, conscientiousness coupled with bitterness. That's easy, isn't it? How easy all of that is. So we pray, our Father in heaven, deliver us from the evil one. When we pray, deliver us from the evil one, with what does God answer our prayer? Paul speaks of the armour of God and exhorts us to put it on and take our stand, clothed in the armour of God. Paul advocates a twofold strategy, the word and the spirit, proclamation and prayer. Ephesians 6 verse 18, Paul says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Paul asked the Ephesians to pray for him that he would fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Here is a key strategy in repelling the evil one and making our stand. The proclamation of the truth of the gospel, making known the victory of Jesus. We are to pray for the victory of Jesus to be proclaimed to others. And I'd add, we're to proclaim it to ourselves as well so that we may stand against the evil one. At the end of 30 years of church planting, evangelism and preaching, the Apostle Paul asks these people to pray that he would preach the gospel fearlessly. He doesn't trust himself to do it on his own. He needs the strength of the Lord to do this work as much as anyone else. Why do we so often feel reluctant or embarrassed or unprepared about offering to people such a great and wonderful gift? Devil's scheme. Let's pray that the gospel will be fearlessly made known to them with careful instruction and great patience, as Paul says in another place, but boldly and fearlessly as well. We have an enemy who has already been defeated. We take our stand against him, equipped by God, as we pray for the fearless proclamation of the gospel. But mainly, Paul emphasises the necessity of prayer. The answer to the prayer for deliverance is prayer. The Christian who is fully engaged in the spiritual battle will be a prayer warrior. Paul says, pray on all occasions with all kinds of prayers, always keeping on praying for all the saints. Here is the key focus of the spiritual battle. And if prayer is the focus of the spiritual battle, how unsurprising it is and how precious that Jesus has given his disciples a prayer to pray, not a magic formula, but a prayer that helps us think right and do right. We come to God as our Father, 
knowing ourselves as children adopted through the gospel, we make our top priority the hallowing of God's name, the coming of his kingdom and the doing of his will. We lay aside concern for my reputation, my will, my plans. Jesus teaches us to pray the prayer that foils all the devil's schemes. If Satan accuses us before the throne of God, Jesus teaches us to pray, forgive us our sins. If Satan tempts us to seek the riches of the world, Jesus teaches us to pray for daily bread. If Satan snarls at our feet, Jesus has delivered us. We need only stand. Can I close with this from Paul's prayer for the Ephesians? Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And in response to hearing God's word, it is right for us to confess our sins together and to receive assurance of his forgiveness. Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life. In your mercy, you have washed us from our sins and made us clean in your sight. Yet we still fail to love you and serve you as we should. Forgive us our sins and renew us by your grace that we may continue to grow as members of Christ in whom alone is our salvation. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ was sacrificed once and for all to bear the sins of many. God therefore forgives those who look to his Son for mercy. Amen.
and the prayer of the day. God, our Father, whose will is to bring all things to order and unity in our Lord Jesus Christ, grant that all the peoples of the world, now divided and torn apart by sin, may be brought together in his kingdom of love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us now come boldly before the throne of grace and bring our requests to our Father in heaven. Let us pray. Our loving Father, we thank you for your faithfulness and provision in enabling the continuation of our worship online. We thank you for the resources, generosity and cooperation of Anglican media, the skill and patient persistence of Tim and Sarah, and the faithful efforts of all involved in seeing services being available each week. We thank you, Father, as well for your hand of blessing on these services as they minister to many in Sydney, in Australia, and indeed around the world. We pray for those who have been able to access these online services, that they would continue to grow in faith and be blessed and be a blessing in your service and to the glory of your name. As we move forward, Father, in opening to live services, Bible studies, small groups, and in time to the public, give us your grace to love each other and faithfully proclaim the gospel so that your name would be glorified and your kingdom extended in us and through us. Father, we now pray that you and your great mercy would bring an end to the global pandemic. For those who are ill, that you would restore them to health, that you would provide for those struggling mentally and emotionally, and that you would bring them to wholeness. For those who have lost loved ones, be their comfort, Father. And for those who are suffering financial loss, show them your provision and a way forward for their future. And dear Lord, as we approach the season of Advent, open our hearts now and each day to receive, celebrate and share the one who came as a man, our Emmanuel, who comes by his spirit to build his church and who will come in glory to take us to himself for all eternity. And it is in his name, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we pray these and all things. Amen. And now let us continue in prayer by praying the words together of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. For the last 36 weeks, it's been an absolute joy and privilege uh, to be joined by so many for this ministry, Church at Home, uh, during the pandemic. Um, we've been tremendously blessed by Anglican media here in Sydney who have generously made this possible, but the people who've made it happen are with me now, and I'm delighted to be able to introduce you to them, Tim Robinson and Sarah Morgans, uh, who've done all the technical work, the editing uh, and the filming each week for those 36 weeks. Thanks so much. You've just, it's absolutely been wonderful to work with you over this time. And we're so thankful um, for what you've done for us and your great uh, generosity and uh, good cheer in working with a bunch of amateurs um, and pulled off something really spectacular. So we just thank God so much for you both. Thank and you. And it's great to be able to have you in front of the camera for a change mm -hmm. on our last week. It's uh, not where I thought I was going to be no. 12 months ago, yeah. if you asked me. Right, okay, there you go. No, none of us did. Um, and uh, Tim, this is, uh, this is very much a ministry for you, uh, as well as your livelihood, but there's another ministry that you're very committed to as well, and I sure. thought it'd be nice to hear about that. Yeah, well, one of the ministries I'm involved with uh, is a Christian motorcycle club. 
So we minister to uh, those in the in the motorcycle scene, yeah. mostly kind of the the, the cruiser style. Uh, guys, but generally it's lifestyle bikers, people that right, are sure. really into their motorcycles. And, yeah. and so we're a place where people can come and, and talk to us. We like to share uh, the, the gospel with them and, yeah. and where we can, but it's all about relationship building for us and just yeah. um, showing, you know, Christ's light in that scene. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so encouraging to know that. And uh, it's been good to hear a little bit about it over the weeks as we've spent some time together mm. every week. Mm. And uh, Sarah, one of the things that we've been talking about um, through this whole period, of course, is when are we going to be able to go back to church? Uh, this is our last episode because the cathedral services are now fully uh, resuming. Um, but uh, maybe you can just say a little bit about what it is about being back at your church that's really encouraging you. Yeah, sure. For me, our church is for that sense of community. Um, and I, I don't think that God designed us to be alone uh, in our journey. I yeah. think he designed us to come together in fellowship. And yeah. it's just, even though we can't sing yet, we still have music and I'm fortunate enough to yeah. be in the music ministry. And um, and I think that when you're all together, you can really feel God's presence. And yeah. it's been challenging, but it's so nice to be back and just to see those familiar faces and yeah. um, just do life with other, other Christian people. It's great. Yeah, we've absolutely missed the, uh, just the personal encouragement of being together being face to face, being able to reach out to hear about what's going on in people's lives and to encourage one another as, as the Bible says. Uh, so great to, uh, great to know that that's happening again for you and it's about to be happening again here at the cathedral. Um, over these 36 weeks, we've heard from many of you from around the country and around the world, from India and Malaysia and Singapore, from South Africa and Nigeria, from Peru and Argentina and Chile, as well as the UK and Canada and the United States. It's been a great privilege to have your company with us and to be able to uh, offer this ministry to you. And we're so thankful to Tim and Sarah for all they've done to make it possible.
Well, thank you from all of us here at St Andrew's Cathedral for joining us for our final church at home. We thank God for this opportunity to serve you, his church, during this time. His word is unstoppable. To him be the glory. And as we finish, let's pray. Gracious God, you made an eternal covenant with us through the blood of your son and brought him back from the dead as the great shepherd of your sheep. Equip us with everything good for doing your will. Work in us what is pleasing to you through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.